Hello there, my name's Claire Downham and I teach at the Institute of Irish Studies at the University of Liverpool. And I want to use this short lecture to tell you a little bit about the history of St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day is of course celebrated internationally as a big festival associated with people wearing green hats and drinking Guinness. But the history of the event itself is quite nuanced and complex. It's an interesting reflection on the history of Ireland itself and its links with Britain and the wider Irish diaspora. So of course the story of St. Patrick's Day um, starts with the man himself. And um, St. Patrick uh, was born in the west of Britain um, in the fifth century, which was just as the Roman Empire was collapsing. And in the chaos of that era, there were piratical raids led from both sides of the Irish Sea. And St. Patrick was captured and taken as a slave in his teens to Ireland. And when he was in Ireland, in this distressing circumstance, he said to have found God, and he was inspired by his faith to escape his captors and return to Britain. But he felt it was his calling to then go back to Ireland and spread the words of Christ to the Irish people. Um, we have this narration of Patrick's deeds in his own words from a text that he wrote called Confession. Um, and this is a really interesting text, not only because it tells us about a period of history when we've got few other written sources um, from Britain and Ireland, but it also shows St. Patrick as quite a vulnerable individual, racked with self-doubt, worried about his mission, and in many ways, quite a different person who is presented in popular culture when we think about images of St. Patrick. And that's because a very different image of St. Patrick was promoted by the Church of Armagh in the Middle Ages. This was the seat of the cult of St. Patrick. They had a vested interest in promoting St. Patrick as this powerful miracle worker. And we can see this recorded in St. Slides from as early as the seventh century. So two centuries after St. Patrick's death, we have the life by a man called Muraku, who presents Patrick as this great magician. He's, he's able to perform miracles and he can outbattle druids in their magic. And so he's a very confident, powerful figure. And from these texts, we get the development of images of St. Patrick in popular culture. So the famous St. Patrick, Patrick contributed to the success of the Church of Armagh. And in the early ninth century, uh, this book was produced of which we see an illustrated page here, the Book of Armagh. And it's in the Book of Armagh that we get early records of the celebration of St. Patrick's Day. It says that St. Patrick's Day should be a feast which is celebrated not just for one day, but for three days and three nights celebrated with eating of good food, um, but without eating meat, and that also people should listen to a sermon of the saint's deed. So rather different to how it's celebrated today. Now the origin of the feast day of St. Patrick was of course religious, but in succeeding centuries, St. Patrick's day also developed a political dimension. When the English invaded Ireland in the late 12th century, the cult of St. Patrick was promoted by the self-proclaimed Prince of Ulster, John de Courcy. And he claimed not only had he found the burial place of St. Patrick, but also of Ireland's two other famous saints, St. Columba and St. Bridget. And St. Patrick's grave is illustrated um, on the left-hand side of this slide. After the Reformation, cult of St. Patrick was still supported by the Protestant Anglo-Irish elite and it was marked by a series of events hosted at Dublin Castle including dinners and fancy balls. It was a highlight of the social celebrations of Dublin life at that time. Later on there would be the trooping of the colours in the courtyard of Dublin Castle which is illustrated here on the slide and this was allowed uh, an event where public people could come and attend um, and it was celebrated that way until the late 19th century when security concerns meant that the public weren't allowed into this event. Of course much greater significance than the political elite commemoration of St Patrick's would be the celebration by the normal people of Ireland and it was marked as a day of markets especially around the settlement of Armagh but it was also marked by dancing, sport, games and feasting. It was regarded day of celebration. And that's because the 17th of March 
often fell within the period of Lent. And it was a day when the rules of Lent could be relaxed. And that's really how St. Patrick's Day becomes associated with indulgence and fun. This is where it all began. The end of the 17th century, an English visitor to Ireland called Thomas Denealy reported that Irish of all stations and conditions wear crosses in their hats, some of pins and some of green ribbons, and the vulgar superstitiously wear shamrocks. And this account tells us that the legend of the shamrock and its association with St. Patrick was already established in Irish society, the shamrock being a plant with three leaves united in one plant, representing the Holy Trinity. But also the, the plant being something that grows wild in Ireland was freely available, and therefore the common people of Ireland, no matter how poor, could afford to get a shamrock and wore it on St. Patrick's Day. It was a very inclusive symbol for the celebration of the saint. Now, the importance of St. Patrick's Day would increase as the Irish traveled overseas. And this is a long part of Ireland's history. Gaelic Irish were recruited as warriors in Europe and um, through the early modern period. And we've got an image here on the left hand side of the slide by the famous artist Albrecht Dürer in the 1520s, showing images of Gaelic soldiers. Also, when the Reformation came, many Catholic exiles travelled from Ireland to the continent to be able to freely continue the expression of their faith. But there were also continuous links with Ireland's nearest neighbour, Britain. And so there was a continuous stream of Irish migration to Britain through the medieval and modern period. And St. Patrick's Day was an opportunity for those who were separated from home to connect and find each other and celebrate their Irish identity. The famous Irish writer Jonathan Swift visited London in 1713 and he commented, I thought all the world was Irish, so great were the celebrations on the streets of London. Now, migration um, from Ireland would spread across the globe with the growth of the British Empire in the 18th century. We have Irish migration to America and Australia becoming quite a significant aspect of the global Irish story. And it's from this wider diaspora that the origins of parades to celebrate St. Patrick's Day begins. So, for example, in 1737, there was the foundation of the Charitable Irish Society of Boston. And this was an association for merchants and gentlemen to raise funds for the poor Irish who were settling in East Coast America. In 1775, the officers of the Sons of St. Patrick held a parade. It was an event that was celebrated with dinners and dances and speeches. Now, there would be a great change in the emphasis of the celebration of St. Patrick's Day abroad in the mid 19th century. These were the years of the Irish famine when many, many people left Ireland in desperation to try and seek new opportunities abroad um, and to try and escape from dire circumstances at home. And this influx of Irish to America led to the development of big parades. This is a very interesting event. It's a very interesting phenomenon that St. Patrick's Day almost became bigger outside Ireland than within it. It was an opportunity for the migrants who had left home to find each other and to celebrate, but also it was a show of their collective force. Individually, the Irish and American society in the mid 19th century were often poor and marginal, but collectively they were mighty and significant. This was their day in the calendar where they should show their greatness. In 1867 in New York, there was a St. Patrick's Day parade that involved 44 bands, 17 carriages and 20,000 marches. And it's at these events we still get, start getting references to the wearing of green clothing on St. Patrick and the drowning of the shamrock. And there's almost a sort of aspect of carnival to these events. So the idea of carnival is the normal order of life is reserved, reversed for a short time. So that those who were marginal in American society, the poor Irish migrants, had a day when they became the centre of Boston society. Those who were excluded celebrated an event that was inclusive. It was open to all, whether you were Irish or not Irish, you could still come along and celebrate and see the parades. And it was a day for those who laboured hard in American society to have a day of relaxation and fun. And it's from America 
that the idea of St. Patrick's Day Parade was exported back to Britain and Ireland. So the character of St. Patrick's Day Parades in America was indeed their inclusivity. Um, so we can see in New York in the 1960s, there's records of green bagels being produced by Jewish bakers. Um, this very, this festival so that everybody could claim to be a little bit Irish for the day. And the way that it really came about was it becomes a celebration of the Irish in America, um, their Irish American patriotism and the growing prominence of the Irish in American society in the late 20th century is when they start to really start to wield uh, a greater measure of political influence. In the close of 20th century, this idea of inclusivity in St. Patrick's Day is marked by the struggle to represent different groups within the parade so that women who had been excluded from some aspects of the parade seek to be included. We see the representation of LGBTQ rights in the parades becoming a factor and also the celebration of a more inclusive and global idea of Irishness. And it's from these parades outside Ireland that the idea of celebrating St. Patrick's Day uh, then becomes influential within Ireland itself. Now, following the independence of Ireland, St. Patrick's Day would, of course, be a rallying point for ideas of national pride and celebration. But they were also an occasion to challenge some of the stereotypes that had been peddled about the Irish, their association with poverty and drunkenness in various migrant communities. And for that reason, St. Patrick's Day was almost crafted as a positive vision of the Irish state. And from 1922 until 1961, alcohol was actually banned on St. Patrick's Day in Ireland. I'm told the only place you could legitimately get a drink on St. Patrick's Day was the Royal Dublin Society Dog Show, which of course was very popular. Now from the 1950s, through American inspiration, we start to see these parade floats being produced. You've got a lovely image there on the left-hand side of Connell Street in Dublin with these uh, floats coming through the city and large crowds watching them go by. But the emphasis of these parades was on the celebration of Irish trade and industry. Again, it's this idea of crafting this positive image of the success of the Irish state. Now, this changes somewhat by the 1990s. Uh, the rules on alcohol are relaxed and St. Patrick becomes re-envisaged much more as a cultural festival marked by music, dance, arts, um, the arrival of our, uh, marching bands from America to participate in the parades in Dublin and various different groups. And that's sort of represented by the image that we have on the right-hand side of the slide there. And this celebration of St. Patrick's Day was very economically successful and it influences how the parades are also crafted in the cities of Belfast and in London. And so what we see is St. Patrick's Day developing within Britain and Ireland, reflecting the global success of Irish culture with phenomena such as river dance and bands such as U2, the Irish pub franchise and the years of the Celtic Tiger. But there is also uh, a deeper relevance to St. Patrick's Day. Um, in the 19th century, uh, quite often St. Patrick's Day could be a day of tension between sectarian divides, Protestants and Catholics, despite the fact that St. Patrick's Day had developed as a cross-denominational development. But it then becomes a significant date for the negotiation of the Northern Irish peace process. And what we have on the left-hand side of the slide here is an image from the year 2000 with Bill Clinton receiving David Trimble, John Hume and Gerry Adams in Washington, a symbol of reconciliation around St. Patrick's Day. And the way that we can also see reconciliation and inclusion in St. Patrick's Day is the celebration of St. Patrick's Day in the island community of Montserrat um, in the Caribbean. And this is the image on the right hand side of the slide here. So St. Patrick's Day has been celebrated since the 1980s as a national holiday on Montserrat. The island had originally been part of the British Empire and it had been settled by Irish indented labourers and enslaved individuals who'd been brought over from African. So they've got along this strong element of Afro-Caribbean culture on the island. 
And even though the history of Montserrat had been marked by tensions between the Irish laborers and the Afro-Caribbean slaves. So for example, in 1768, there had been an uprising by the enslaved community on St. Patrick's Day. But nevertheless, many on the island uh, do claim descent um, from the Irish laborers. And so we can see the reconciliation of this complex history in Montserrat with this celebration on the island today, representing this wonderful fusion of Afro-Caribbean and Irish culture. And so there's been quite a significant history in the development of St. Patrick's Day from the fifth century when St. Patrick escaped uh, from Ireland and then returned to nowadays the way that St. Patrick's Day is a day of celebration for modern outlooking global Ireland. And as I mentioned, the history of St. Patrick's Day is really a history which tells us so much about Ireland's links with Britain and the wider world. And it's something that we can do to reflect on, not only looking to the past, but also looking forward to the future as well. Thank you for listening. <laughs>